Resources for South Carolina. And today she's going to talk to us a little bit about, or a lot about, Turtle Patrol. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's very exciting this year uh, because we are once again allowed to have new volunteers join our patrol. Uh, we have at least 15 to 20 new people that have called and signed up already and been assigned to a zone. Our beach is divided for hatching patrol into one mile lengths we call zones. And there is a zone captain for each one of the zones. They each have a list of volunteers that are their volunteers for their zone. They do the scheduling, they set up so that as soon as a nest is in their zone, it's watched, covered, and taken care of for the 50 or 60 days until it hatches. And once there's been an emergence, three days later, they dig into the nest and inventory the contents, counting the unhatched eggs, the hatched shells, and sometimes there are live hatchlings in there, which is what so exciting to everyone, including the public, because then we have to release them down into the ocean. And everybody is able to help by forming lines to keep the birds away. Um, so everybody has a real good time with that. It's a little disappointing when you don't have a hatchling, a live hatchling in the nest. However, it means that that was an excellent nest and they all got out on their own. And that's our ultimate goal, is to let it all happen naturally and only help if it's needed. Um, some of the things that the zone people will do on hatching patrol is if the wind builds up the sand on top of the nest, they'll have to clear it off, level it down so that the nest depth does not grow by more than a few inches. And that could happen if it's not cleared off, especially if there's a screen on it because of predation, then if it builds, the sand builds up on there, the hatchlings will not be able to get through the screen and they'll get caught and they'll die before being able to emerge. So there's also when it rains hard, the sand gets packed on top of the nest. We call that sand doming. And the hatching patrollers need to dig hand depths into the nest cavity to soften up all of that sand so that, again, the turtles don't get trapped by packed, wet sand. So there are a lot of different things they need to watch for predators. If there are any predators like raccoons or birds or whatever, then sometimes we will screen that nest if the zone captain calls for it. Now the screening would come from what we call nesting patrol. They're the folks that are on the truck and they start at the western end of the beach and drive the entire length of the beach investigating crawls. You could be out here for three hours or you could be out for six. It depends on how much activity took place the night before. But the nesting patrollers evaluate the crawls, read the field signs, probe for the nest, and we probe for the nest using um, a probe like this between your feet and probing down into the nest, looking for that nest cavity. When you find the nest cavity, it'll give. And if you're not between your legs and using your knees, mm -hmm. you will fall on your face. We have had people do that. Oh, no. <laughs> so, but anyway, and whenever we deal with eggs, nests, relocating, marking, we always wear gloves. Always. Okay. Um, a nest card, the truck is responsible for um, populating the nest card. And the nest card will stay with that nest all the way through. I don't know if you can see this, but you get a date from when the nest was laid. We identify whether it was a nest or a false crawl, whether it was a loggerhead or something else. If we moved it, oh, we also get GPS readings, the long and lat for each one of the nests. If we have to relocate it because it's below the high tide, then we also have to put all of that information on the relocation area on the card as well. 
Then this card goes from the truck to the zone captains, and the zone captains keep this, make all kinds of notes for the 50 to 60 days that that nest is in the ground, mm -hmm. and comment so that DNR will know exactly what's happened with this nest at the end of the season. Then three days later, the back of the nest card is used for the inventory data. Right. So these all eventually go back to DNR. All of it gets entered into a database, and these are our field cards, if you will. Very cool. Very cool. So we all love it. As soon as you see a tiny little hatchling, the size of the you know, the palm of your hand, you fall in love with it. And we have vacationers that come here every year just to do turtle patrol. That's they plan their vacation so that they can do that. So it's really kind of exciting. Um, and periodically, you do get to see a mother turtle. Um, they do generally lay their nests in the dark, anywhere, say, from 9 o'clock at night until 6 o'clock in the morning but when you get onto the beach early at six o'clock you can sometimes see her covering her nest and heading back to the ocean and that's pretty exciting too oh, it awesome. really is so but and people will ask where's the best place to go to see a turtle well you can't predict we have a 10 mile beach and I just told you anywhere from nine to six in the morning <laughs> who knows yeah. it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time you're lucky if okay. you get to see one and what would you say to those people who are maybe interested in turtle patrol but not necessarily joining, how can they help the turtles? They can definitely help by filling in holes at the end of their day at the beach so that hatchlings or mama turtles don't get trapped in those big deep holes. Okay. They can also not use flashlights on the beach unless they have a red lens. Now, if people don't have a red lens, Town Hall and the Nature Center have these stickers for flashlights that will you create a red lens rather than your typical white light. Mm -hmm. Because the white light will disorient the hatchlings and the mama turtles as well. So never use a white light on the beach. Um, we also have smaller size uh, stickers so that even with your cell phone you can put that on your light of your cell phone and have a red light and it's daytime so you can't see this yeah. but it is enough light to see where you're going so you're not going to trip and fall or anything. So we actually have two turtles on Kiowa that we call Stubby 1 and Stubby 2. Okay. <laughs> this, one is missing a right rear flipper, so when you see the crawl, you see a punch on the right side rather than a sweep of the, of the flipper, and vice versa with Stumpy too. He's got a left missing flipper, so you see the punch on that left side. Amazingly, they are still able to dig their nests. Not as deep, and many times we have to move those nests because they're only working with one flipper. It's the hind flippers that they use to dig the nest. Normally, they will alternate with the scoops of the rear flippers. And with Stumpy 1 and Stumpy 2, many times it's a very shallow nest or there's eggs still on the top that are barely covered with sand. So we definitely have to move something like that because the nests are generally 24 inches deep average okay yeah okay. so and you know helping them survive and we believe that we're seeing evidence of it DNR believes as well so it's not just me speaking that we're seeing evidence of the increase in the population due to the conservation efforts with the sea turtles that started back 25 to 30 years ago. And that's why our numbers are increasing. So that's, it's kind of a success story in itself. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, You're Lynn. very welcome. And thank you everyone for watching today. And we will see you again with some more information about something else interesting. Thanks again.